Hello, everyone. My name is TJ Anderson, and on behalf of the American Marketing Association, I'd like to welcome you to this special edition CMO survey webinar. The webinar will begin shortly, but before we begin, I just wanted to point out that any questions you have for the presenters during the webinar should be entered into the questions and answers tab on the left side of your screen, not the studio chat tab, the questions and answers tab. Also, I'd like to thank the CMO survey and Marketing Science Institute for organizing today's webinar with the AMA. And now we'll take a moment to recognize our presenting sponsor. I'm pleased to introduce Brittany Keegan, who is a marketing and strategy manager at Redpoint Global. Thank you, TJ. As he mentioned, I'm Brittany Keegan from Redpoint Global, the presenting sponsor for today's event. Redpoint Global provides a technology platform that helps innovative companies transform customer experiences by connecting disparate customer data that resides in many different systems, using machine learning to predict segments, make recommendations, determine next best actions, and more, and delivering experiences across on and offline channels using a company's existing last mile MarTech solutions. Redpoint helps retailers financial services firms, healthcare organizations, and travel and hospitality companies create a single point of customer control and then orchestrate real-time interactions that drive business results. Today, we're excited to present this conversation with Professor Christine Mormon and Earl Taylor to help us all better understand how COVID-19 will shape the future of marketers in our country. I'll now pass it over to Earl, who will be moderating today's discussion. Thanks, Brittany. Uh, again, uh, this is Earl Taylor, Chief Knowledge Officer at the Marketing Science Institute. We're a nonprofit that funds academic research on topics uh, related to marketing, and we're very pleased to be working on this particular uh, project uh, with Chris Mormon, uh, who will tell us about the impact of COVID-19 on marketing and plans for the future. So with that, Chris. Thank you, Earl, and thank you, to all of you who are attending today's session. Um, we've been working on this special edition survey for the last few months, designing it and implementing it, and then scouring through the results for the insights. And so I'm excited to have the opportunity to share what we've uncovered with you um, during this session. So for, for those of you that aren't familiar with the CMO survey, um, I started back in 2008 with the mission to collect and disseminate the opinions of top marketers in order to predict the future of markets, track marketing excellence, um, and improve the value of marketing in firms and in society. And I think there, there was and there continues to be an ongoing need for forward-looking indicators and for KPIs that marketing leaders can bench their progress against with the goal of improving marketing's contributions. We do this by surveying marketing leaders twice a year and creating reports that are made freely available to practitioners, the media, and members of the academic community. And as I hope you'll see in my presentation of the results, one of the benefits of our survey approach is that we repeat some of the questions over time. And so this gives us a very informative vantage point on marketing actions um, and marketing outcomes. So before jumping into the agenda, um, I'm going to, I just want to pause here and thank uh, my survey sponsors, uh, Deloitte uh, and the Fuqua School of Business at Duke University, as well as my media partner, uh, the American Marketing Association. Special thanks also, of course, to the Marketing Science Institute for helping to host this event and to Redpoint Global for their sponsorship. So um, just in terms of the, the bigger picture, so you have a way to kind of frame the re these results, um, this is a sort of a demographic portrait, if you will, of the special edition. It reflects nearly 300 top marketers' perspectives um, at for-profit U.S. companies, um, and 97% of whom are VP or higher. And we collected this data, importantly, I think, between May 7th and May 28th. So, and most of the results that I'm going to share with you today don't get into any of these industry, economic, or firm size differences. 
But I wanted to let you know because so many practitioners do write to me and say, well, what about my industry? What's happening within my industry? Um, what, you, what we do is we produce one report that takes every question that uh, we ask in the survey and cuts the results by these different um, sector and, uh, and five levels. So you can take a deeper dive into, for example, um, healthcare or banking, if that's your sector, by looking at uh, the report that's associated with that deeper dive, which you can find on the cmosurvey.org website. So the way that we've structured the, um, the, the, the presentation today is into a series of five bins. This is our plan. We think it's going to work. We wanted to give an opportunity for questions throughout, and you should feel free to um, interject with questions that you can write, as TJ mentioned, in the questions and answer tab. Um, we'll pause for those. If they're big, wide-ranging questions, probably keep those for the end of the presentation. Um, and then if we don't, if we start running short on time, I'll just skip over the little pauses that, that we have for the Q&A section. But I'm, I'm hopeful that we'll have an opportunity um, to do a lot of that. Okay, so let's just jump right into the results. And um, the first section is our coverage around macroeconomic forecasts. And just to kind of, a, I think for me, it was interesting to always observe that when People were wondering about what was going to be happening, happening in markets, and markets, of course, uh, are driven by customers. I always found it sort of peculiar that they would ask CFOs these questions. And so when we designed the CMO survey, we put in questions about the overall economy because we thought it was important. And as you might have expected with regard to um, the pandemic, marketer optimism did fall, um, and this is, again, over for the overall U.S. economy, um, I'm going to have two views that I want to share with you. First, the one that I have up here right now, um, in their rating of, of optimism, we see that marketers' ratings have really slowly dropped from February of 2018, but there was a very precipitous drop of almost 20% um, between February of 20, just, just two or three months ago, and um, the May rating that we picked up, which we labeled June throughout these slides because that's when we published the results. Um, what's also interesting, again, this is the longitudinal view. We can see that, um, that this number actually gets very close to the, to the first, I would say, valid rating that we have of this indicator, um, which was in February of 2009, just a few months after the, 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 uh, the Great Recession hit. And so um, that's one view. The second view I can share with you is that we ask, it, the first rating was on a zero to 100 scale, but this is a slightly different view, um, which asks, are you more or less, um, or is there no change in your optimism level? And what you can see is that this change in um, the, 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 the less optimistic indicator has steeply risen. In fact, it's, it's much higher even than it was um, with the Great Recession and, um, and, and risen from 30% even as late as February 2020. So this is a big increase. So I think we know that marketers are worried about the economy and this is certainly reflected in what we see. What do they think is going to happen with consumer behavior? We have a couple key results here that I think are, are very informative. So that when we ask people to rate different types of customer behavior, um, we gave them a list and said, you know, basically, to what extent do you think that these have happened in your largest sales market? And so for this analysis, what we've done is we've clustered these into three groups, frequent, occasional, and infrequent. And so what we see, if you look kind of deeply within each of these bins, I think there's sort of two pieces of news that I want you to take away from this slide. First is that in this, in this frequent bin, we see that marketers are in fact reporting that consumers have become very digital in their orientation. And that is reflected in the fact that they have a new openness to digital offerings, as you see here, uh, that they place increased value on digital experiences. Um, and, and so that's, I think, the beginning of what we'll see throughout this presentation as part of what triggers the marketing response 
and then a number of the other financial indicators that follow. What's also interesting is that on the infrequent, things that we might have thought were, uh, would have, have risen to be much higher, that would have been my hypothesis. For example, unwillingness to pay, I would have expected this number to be much higher than 48%, or weaker loyalty levels, I might have expected that number to be higher, but they weren't. Um, and so again, that kind of goes to the fact that there, there is some good news in this, uh, that, that consumers didn't radically change their behaviors. We do see uh, in this sort of middle bin a lower likelihood to buy, which is certainly troubling. But overall, it certainly isn't um, as negative a portrait as we might have expected. And when we asked marketers to report, this is one of these forward-looking measures that we try to ask in the survey fairly regularly, uh, when will customer behaviors return to pre-pandemic levels? Pretty much uniformly, we didn't ask all of the questions that I had in those three bins because we were trying to be, trying to be sensitive about taking too much time with the survey. We picked those that we thought marketers might care most about. And so as you look here, what you see is that, that the most predominant uh, temporal rating was around this six to 12 months um, time horizon that people expect likelihood to buy, purchase, you know, pay full price, loyalty levels to regain their footing within six to 12 months. Um, but on the other hand, out here, in terms of increased value placed on digital experiences, uh, we see that they expect that will never return to normal. And so what that means is, of course, that marketers expect that this turn to digital is, represents something relatively permanent um, in the way that consumers operate in the marketplace. The last piece of the consumer behavior that I wanted to cover is, this is a question, again, that we've been asking from the very beginning of the survey, February 2009 is the date I'm recording here. And, um, and that's the very first black bar. So what we do is we ask people, we ask marketers to rate their customers' top three priorities. And, um, and so what I'm reporting here is the percent of marketers that reported this particular priority as first. And so we see superior product quality, excellent service, trusting relationships, superior innovation, and low price. And um, there's a couple of things I want to point out to you that are important here. First, we have seen this rise over time. And it, it's, it's dramatic when you put it in the context of February 2009, uh, but it, has, it stays high here during the pandemic that marketers believe that customers are emphasizing, continue to emphasize, believe that it's most important for, for companies to perform well on a trusting relationship. And, um, and like I said, this isn't a fluke. Um, this percent has actually increased 47% um, from the very first time it was asked in 2009. And so I, you'll all have to think about this on your own, what this means for your company. But I think there's a significant opportunity for marketers to, to think through how they can serve their customers' need for a trusting relationship. And it'll probably look differently depending on your company and your sector. But it appears to go beyond just the core business, um, that core business elements that we saw earlier. Um, and one of the things that was reported was this idea of doing good. So I just want to put that out there, that that was in that frequently observed uh, consumer behavior. I think trusting relationship has something to do with that, as well as obviously living up to the expectations that consumers have. The other finding that I want to point out to you is, um, is around this um, final indicator for price. So contrast what we saw with trust with this focus on low price, which first off, we can see this dip from 2009. Uh, we're of course probably in, again, right there in the Great Recession, people are very focused on price. Uh, that number has dropped considerably to be the lowest in, uh, priority that marketers believe their customers are focused on. Now with the pandemic, that has risen back up. 
but again, it's not risen to the level of things like trust or even product quality. Um, so consumers do have budget constraints. That's obviously something that's going on. But my prediction is that this number will drop back down by the time we reach the next survey. So let me just pause here and see if there are any questions that uh, we can field at this juncture. Sure, thanks, Chris. Uh, John had a question about will the slides be available after the presentation? So this presentation um, is a, an amalgamation of different things that I've put together from the reports that are available on the website. Um, I don't see why I couldn't make this available um, as a separate report. It does mimic what's already available um, on the cmosurvey.org website. Um, there's a few different infographs and things that we've used, but I think we could just post this as a separate um, presentation and, and have it available because I think there are some nice additions that we've made over time. Sure. That, that's great. And as you pointed out earlier, a lot of the breakdowns by a business sector will appear in that report as well. That's right. Okay, that was a very clear presentation. I think we're tracking with you. So um, let's move on to the next section. So the, the next section I wanted to cover was, you know, what, what did marketers do? So we know what they think about the economy. We know what they think about consumer behavior. Uh, but what did they actually do? And the, this first slide, this is uh, one of the newer slides that we inserted. I want to thank the AMA for helping us create some of these special infographs for the webinar. Um, what this shows, what we asked was basically to what degree were, was marketing in your company prepared to face the pandemic? And what you can see here, and this is seven point scale where seven is we had a strong plan in place and one is that we didn't have a plan. And, you can see that, you know, the numbers are, there's heterogeneity there, but the numbers are not, obviously not high. They're not super low, but um, I think we can safely conclude that there was not probably a lot of preparation for the pandemic. Um, and you might ask yourself, well, how could people be prepared? Um, I think that's a fair question. Um, later, I'm going to profile one company that I think did take a very productive approach to that planning process and engaged in some uh, information strategies and learning strategies that, that proved to be pretty helpful to them. But overall, I think what we can see is that um, for the most part, the preparation was on the lower side. Um, the second piece of this is that um, it, it kind of correspondingly, um, there was what you might call a lot of improvisation. Um, so, you know, kind of making things up as we go along in the sense that, you know, there wasn't a plan in place. We, we needed to figure out what to do. You can see that that's on the high side, which I think, again, goes together with the fact that there weren't um, contingency plans in place. So that's one piece of this. The other piece of this is, and I'm going to uh, come back to this point at the very end of the presentation, that marketers actually believe that the strategies that they use, which I'm going to describe to you, um, do offer them important long-term opportunities. Um, and I think the evidence is really clear that that's the case when we see, again, what they did, the performance, the budgetary alignment around these results. Um, there, there is some good news in here for marketing. And so what were those priorities? Um, what we did here was we, we asked about all of the priorities that you see listed here, and they have um, percentages associated with them that you can look at, again, in more detail. But what I'm going to do is focus on this first strongly prioritized um, cell, and then later on come back to these weakly prioritized activities uh, to suggest that there were some missed opportunities. So on the strongly prioritized um, activities, what really emerges here is that um, marketers were in a position and acted on the opportunity to basically help their companies improve their, the, the, the digital interfaces that they use for in, engaging with con customers and also helping transform their companies' go-to-market business models. These are important strategic activities. Uh, marketers are in a wonderful position to help guide these activities. 
um, and lead on these activities. So it was actually really reassuring to see marketers offering um, this, this view of, of what they see as the opportunities. And the other piece of this is that we asked them essentially what marketing objectives were you focused on during this time. And there may have been other things that we could have listed here, but we chose these five. And if you look at the results, what you see are there's sort of two big bins of emphasis. One is on a building brand that connects with the customer, and then very, very closely on retaining uh, current customers. But those were the big activities that marketers, when they put the digital muscle behind, uh, you know, in, in, in help the organizations exercise the digital muscle, it was really in the direction of these two objectives. We also asked, how did you use use your marketing um, employees, which is another way of kind of asking the same question. And we, we get the same view of where marketers put the emphasis. It was on getting online to promote the company, developing new strategies basically for reaching out to customers with information and also improving the digital interfaces. So it, the emphasis was clearly in that direction for marketers. The other piece of this, as we think about uh, the strategies that marketers use, is the emphasis on social media spending. So this is something we've been tracking for a long time. You can see here what we ask is what percent of your marketing budget um, do you, are you spending on social media? And we've asked that, it, we asked it specifically related to the pandemic, uh, but we've also asked it you know, every six months, I think since 2015 was the first indicator. And of course, social media um, is a very important tool for marketers to stay engaged with their customers. And, um, and so the, essentially what we see here is that they've increased their investment in social media budgets and increased it by a huge margin. So if you look under February, 2020, uh, we see it was 13.3%. That rose up to 23.2% of budgets um, in here in, in this June 2020 report. Um, and that's, a, as we note in the cover there, it's a 74% increase. It's really the largest single increase. We've seen these numbers kind of, you know, rising up a little bit over time, but this is a dramatic increase that we've seen. So... Um, and, and also, I think it's important and interesting because often we think about social media as a kind of a B2C thing. I think that's not the case um, because when we look at the sectors, which I report to you here, um, we can see that B2B companies are also spending quite a lot of money on social media. And they expect to, to continue to do so for the next 12 months. So this, this spending is not going to, um, to, to drop off. And probably even more important um, than the spending specifically is the fact that marketers for really the very first time in CMO survey history um, report that they think social media's contribution to company performance um, has increased. Um, and so we, what I do is I show you the overall number here on the left-hand side, which has a mean of 4.2 on a seven point scale. So this isn't huge in terms of the contribution level, but again, this is where the longitudinal view of the data becomes very effective because what we can see here, and I'm just showing you on the right-hand side, the August 2019, February 2020, and now the June 2020 numbers, <coughs> excuse me, and we can see that these numbers have been in this kind of 3.3, 3.4, uh, range, they really have not risen for probably five years. Um, and that's been a point of contention and actually a critique that we've leveled against social media spending because it seems like people are spending a lot, but they're not getting any lift in performance. Here we see the lift, um, a 23% since February, 27% since um, August. And so this is I think this is important because it means that, you know, with customers not being able to 
to do as much, you know, with distancing, et cetera, that social media really did seem to pay off for them. And just because it might be interesting to you, I put this slide in here. We asked about influencers. It's the first time we've asked about influencers. We asked, and we tried to ask these questions so that we can give you kind of a, a, a longitudinal view. So we asked, what were you doing a year ago? What are you doing now in terms of the percent of marketing budget that you're spending on any type of influencers? And then what, what will you spend three years from now? And so what we can see is that right now about 7.5%, that's risen a little bit, not, not much, but the expectation is that within three years that will almost double. So, um, Again, important to think about in terms of what your company is doing. So then I think just a few other points on the, um, on the digital side. We also see this mobile list, just like we saw with the social list. So again, about the same 70, 75%. Um, mobile has had a stronger trajectory. If you look at the, the spending, it's, been, it's had a bigger list. Um, but what's interesting is that during the um, during these pandemic uh, months, um, they did not have um, they did not reveal a significant lift in terms of performance. Um, you know, maybe consumers are stuck at home. Um, you know, they have their desktops and laptop, laptops in front of them, and, and mobile's just not as important as it would be if they were mobile. Um, and so. Um, so probably the challenge for marketers when we think about the social and mobile piece is to maintain, to help consumers maintain and expand their successful social habits and then migrate those uh, across to uh, mobile even as they, consumers increase their movement. Um, so just one final piece on this um, in terms of spending. Um, since we're talking about the increase in digital, I think it, it probably should make sense, and I'm showing you this more just as a validity exercise, that in fact, spending on traditional advertising, which would be non-digital, has been negative for a long time in the survey. Uh, it dropped considerably to negative 5.3% in terms of the growth rate. We always ask growth rates so that marketers can comfortably share their expenditure levels with us. Um, so I think, again, that just, again, should be a, a validity check. So we've talked a little bit about the, you know, what consumer behaviors are changing. Uh, we've talked about the marketer's emphasis on digital. And I think it then should make sense to you to, to see this result that I'm, I'm sharing with you right now, which is when we ask marketers, how has the role of marketing in your company uh, changed during COVID-19? Um, we see that 62% or 0.3 at least, uh, or, or sorry, 62.3% report that it has increased the importance of marketing in their company. Um, and there's a little bit of variability. B2B was a much bigger winner, it looks like, when you look at the numbers to your, to your right by the sector. Um, but in fact, there's a, it looks like that this was, again, one of the, the positive things for marketers um, when facing uh, the pandemic. So I think I'll stop there um, and take your questions. I did want to point out, I do have a point of, of a link that you can click through and type to sign up to participate in the CMO survey. We're always looking for participants that qualify. So if you are a lead marketer, a head marketer within your company and you're in the United States and for for profit, please feel free to, to sign up to participate. That would be wonderful. Earl? Yes, there is a, just a process question. Nitu was asking if this is being recorded, and the answer is yes, you will have a recording available after this event. Um, AJ had a question about to what extent these uh, findings that you're reporting were directly related to COVID-19 as opposed to maybe recent events. But given the dates, I'm assuming it's primarily the COVID uh, impact at this point. Is that correct? I think so. I'm trying to remember when um, the other race-related activities happened. So this, our survey was in the field from May 7th to May 27th. So I, I, I can't remember the exact dates when all of that right. happened. I think, I think we're, the, what we're seeing here is more related to the 
And I could talk a little bit later about, we did ask about some political activism by brands. I didn't put that in the survey because essentially we saw no lift. Um, so marketers, only about 18% of companies uh, or marketing leaders report that they're willing to use their brands um, in a politically active way. So, and that number really hasn't changed for about the last three years. So, AJ, if we were, if we were seeing, I think, some shift with regard to Black Lives Matter, et cetera, then, then I think those numbers probably would have been higher. So I think we're outside of that time horizon. It sounds like something, again, we can maybe discuss uh, more at the, at the end of the general discussion. But Nicole had a related question, which is, do you anticipate the social media spend will decrease uh, with the uh, beginning of the boycott of Facebook advertising? That is something that has, I guess, emerged in the last week or two. So speculating a bit, do you think that maybe there will be a little less emphasis on social media given some of the controversy? Well, that's a very good question. I don't, I don't have a good crystal ball on that. Uh -huh. um, so I'm, I probably n not try to answer that. I think, you know, anything that sensitizes marketers to how their customers are going to understand their activities probably should be taken into account. Um, when, when we asked the question back in May, that, was, that wasn't on the horizon. So it very well could be the case. Um, but it does, my sense is that this was, this period was a turning point in the way that marketers thought about social um, and also the fact that it did seem to have more gravity in the consumer's life, perhaps because they were stuck at home. Right. There are a number of other questions on that general topic, but I think we will defer for the dis uh, broader discussion. But there was one question about uh, the difference uh, in influencers and in, in social media in B2B versus B2C. That could be a, a webinar in itself, but if you just wanted to comment briefly on that. I, if I remember those breakouts um, correctly, they were there was a lot of activity among B2B companies with the use of influencers. We can, again, you can go into that. Um, I think it might even be in the highlights and insights report, which is the equivalent version of what I'm presenting that's up on the website. I think we break it out by the sectors in that presentation that you can look at. It, it surprised me that the extent to which the B2B companies do use influencers. They don't use them as much on Twitter and right. Facebook and things like that, but they report using them on LinkedIn. They report using them on their own company websites and blogs. So there was a, there was a lot more activity than I expected. I think that's a good, question, a good answer to that question. So uh, with that, I think let's go ahead and then move into the next section. Then. Thanks, Earl. So the next topic I want to talk about is marketing jobs. So, so remember, more emphasis on digital marketers asked to deliver against that. Um, marketers feeling and reporting that marketing is more important. Um, at the same time, what we see with marketing jobs, and this is a very dramatic part of the results that I want to share with you, is that um, marketers report that they, on average, lost 9%. Of, of their headcount. Um, but what's important about this depiction, which has a very long tail associated with it, as you can see, is that 62% um, report no loss. So really the modal response, the most common experience for marketers uh, in the survey panel uh, is that they stayed on the job. Their headcount wasn't lost, so they didn't lose any headcount. Um, but again, the other 40% did. So, um, you know, they were doing essentially more with fewer people in that group of companies, that 40%. Um, so I think that's one piece of uh, result that I wanted to share with you. And then the other part of this is that when we ask people, again, in the forward-looking sense, um, when do you anticipate these jobs returning, 24%, um, the largest percentage uh, reported that they didn't expect uh, marketing jobs would ever return. Um, again, there's a lot of heterogeneity in these answers. So if you look across that graph, you'll see, you know, 15% expect quick return. Um, but again, just, just kind of reporting what is, we do see this large number on the never end of the spectrum. And in, and in my conversations with marketer, marketing leaders, um, 
Many have noted that the, both the move to digital may, sh may sort of foreshadow that kind of quote unquote never return status. Um, but in other companies, people have told me that, that there's a sense that perhaps maybe marketing was slightly overbuilt in terms of headcount um, and that this, these reductions might get them into more of a right size modality going forward. Um, I don't know where your company lies on that spectrum, but we could think about we could think about a number of reasons why it looks this way. And you'll you'll see here some of that heterogeneity is explained by the sector results. Um, so CPG never expects these numbers to return. Transportation never expects these numbers to return. But energy services, banking, they expect quick returns. And then. Another, um, I think, point that, that, that really does go to the expectations that they have is, is the expected hiring really looks the same. So if we were to, if there was going to be a big flip in this, we might have expected this number not to be so low, but it's a very low number. It's, it's the lowest percent, again, percentage change, which is what we ask about in marketing hires, so negative 3.5%. So it doesn't look like marketers are going to be being, they're not, most of them will not be replaced um, in that time period. But I think it's also interesting as a final point in terms of um, the human capital piece in marketing is we asked, we'd asked this question a couple times about prioritized skills. Uh, we decided to ask it again in this survey because we thought this might change the way that people think about, you know, what was important in a marketer. Um, and we added a few skills that, that we thought might be important in dealing with the uncertainty of the pandemic. And as you can see from the results that I'm showing you, which shows the, basically the ranking, how many people ranked these different skills. Um, the ability to pivot as new priorities emerged was ranked as most important by marketers completing the survey. And that was followed by creativity and innovation um, and the ability to navigate ambiguity. Two of, the, two of those top three, the one and three are the new ones that I added for this survey. So um, I think it's something that marketers are going to have to think about. Um, how do we develop these skills? I know, you know I'm thinking about this myself when I teach my students um, next fall. You know, what, how can I encourage them to think about pivoting, about being more agile? What does that look like? Um, and I think it's both a mindset and a set of behaviors, and I think it's something that marketers overall will need to, to think about. And one point about developing these skills is that I think they, marketers will probably need to take stock of their training and development budgets because we saw that number drop from 5.8% of marketing budgets to 44 So there was a drop-off in expenditures related to training and development um, if they really do want these skills, not only among their new hires, which we asked about, but among their current people, it's probably something that they're going to have to devote some funding to. Let's look now at marketing performance. Um, and I really just have two basic points that I want to make to you here. One is there's some good news and there's some bad news. Um, the good news is that that the focus on digital that we had been talking, we've been talking about from the beginning really has paid off for companies. So th again, this is the question we've been asking for a long time. Uh, what percent of your firm's sales are through the internet? Um, and what you can see is that it's just, I mean, it has certainly risen since February of 2009, but it's really fluttered uh, along relatively unevenly with no real dramatic lift maybe in the in February we started to see some lift but we see a huge takeoff here in June 2020 um, and it's it's very impressive when you look at that 42 percent increase and you realize it's just a couple months away from when we collected the data for the February survey so that's the good news so it appears to have paid off I mean marketers as you will see earned fewer sales revenue or lower levels of sales revenue but the percent that came from these digital sales was higher. And so the rough news, the bad news is that marketers do report major losses across 
sales revenue, profits, and customer acquisition. Um, and I'm showing you here the numbers for sales revenue, which are the most dramatic. And it shows, a, again, a huge spectrum of losses from greater than 50% in terms of you know, gains and also losses on the other end. The mean loss was 17.8%. And um, but the largest number was over 50% loss. So many companies lost a lot of money in terms of sales revenues. Just when you look at that whole spectrum, one way to think about that, because we see zero in the middle, uh, only 5.2% reported zero. But overall, considering those kind of what, what you might call winners and losers, 64% of marketers report losses. That's on the left side. 30% report gains. So um, in the figures that I'll flash up quickly for profits and customer acquisition look a little bit different. They're less negative, but they look very similar. What's important, I think, too, is to look underneath there. Again, from a forward-looking perspective, marketers anticipate that sales revenues will return in the next 12 months, and this is the percent that they expect will occur. So here are the numbers for profits. Again, you can see that here it's only negative 14%. Um, again, same sort of very large distribution. Um, and then finally on the customer acquisition front, here uh, the, the negative is much lower, um, well, much higher, I guess, because it's less negative. But the, the, the mode here is zero, which means that for 22% of our, um, you yeah, 22% or so of these companies didn't lose any customers or didn't, rather, didn't acquire fewer customers, if that makes sense. Okay. So then on spending, I just want to make a couple quick points, um, and then um, we can stop for some more questions. Um, so What you can see here is that, you know, recall that marketers have been put on the front line to work on the digital, these new go-to-market business models, um, and that, that seems to have paid off with digital sales, as I showed you earlier. So there's two marketing spending facts that I want to show you now that I think are really consistent with this view that, that, that emerges from the survey. First, on average, which you see on this slide, um, Marketers report that they've gained about 5% um, in their budget, 5.2%. Okay, so headcount was lost. And for a lot of companies, they don't put headcount into their marketing budgets. I know some of you do. From my earlier results, I think about 45% of companies do. Um, but the majority do not. So kind of keep that in mind as you interpret these results. Um, but the average budget increase was 5.2%. Um, for marketing. And then when you look at the sort of, again, gains and losses, 30% experienced no change in marketing budget, 41% an increase, and 28% experienced losses. And when we look again over here in terms of forward-looking indicators, these budget changes are expected to return to normal levels in about 6 to 12 months. Um, and so it doesn't look like marketers expect that to those budgets to stay for more than that, but they expect them to hold on for the next year. So that's one piece. But the other piece that I want to show you, and it's a piece that I'm so happy that we asked this question um, because it, it really gives us some important insights. So what you see here is that we ask, what percentage of your firm's overall budget does marketing currently account for? And same thing, marketing expenses account for what percent of your firm revenues? Okay. So this helps us try to understand marketing budgets, I think, in a very effective way. Because, of course, if you're a big company, you have a bigger budget. If you're a smaller company, you have a smaller budget. So putting these in the context of overall budgets and overall firm revenues, um, I think, helps us um, interpret things, interpret what's happening with marketing in a very important way. And what we see here is that marketing budgets 
have risen to the highest percent of firm budget and firm revenues in the survey's history. And so, and we know that, you know, firm revenues dropped and I'm betting that a firm overall budgets probably dropped. Um, but marketing budgets didn't drop at the same rate. If they had, these numbers would have gone down. Um, and what we see instead is that we see an 11.5% 11 11 increase for February for the first and a 32 or almost 33% increase for uh, the second. So I think, again, that shows when we, when we showed that pie chart where I, I showed you what was happening in terms of the perceived importance of marketing, you know, as other parts of the company shut down um, because, you know, you, operations were very difficult for many companies, um, marketing picked up some of that budget. They picked up um, some of the, the, the frontline work in terms of engaging with customers and developing digital tools to do that. So I think I'll stop there on this point and see if we have any questions before I jump into the oppor missed opportunities. Yeah, thanks very much, Chris. A lot of coverage there, and, and there were a number of questions. Uh, one that Gil raised was uh, a, a few slides back, marketers were reporting the increased importance of marketing, and you just mentioned the budget situation. Um, to clarify, uh, you know, marketers would probably be inclined to say that uh, optimistically, perhaps, but your survey is looking at fairly senior execs. These are people that actually have a purview of where the marketing budget's going, and that, this is not just marketers hoping that the function or feeling that the function is more important. Is that correct? That's correct. I think it's a fair question. Uh, we asked a similar question. I don't have the numbers on my fingertip. Um, actually, it's a, it's a piece that's just about to come out in Forbes where we, com we asked a similar question, like has the role of marketing broadened over the last five years? And we asked it a couple of years ago. We didn't see anything like the lift that we saw in this survey. So I don't think it's wishful thinking. Um, because if anything, my guess is that, um, you know, marketers were struggling because we see them trying to do more with less in terms of headcount um, and probably being thrust into situations where they, they hadn't really maybe had a, a, an important role so, um, or as an important role. I was so. going to say the, the theme throughout seems to be that, that uh, in this uh, situation, people did turn to the marketing, kind of good news, bad news, be careful what you ask for. But we always <laughs> complain about not having a seat at the table, and it sounds like marketing certainly does, but it's the hot seat. So uh, um, there was a question about uh, maybe you can just paint broadly about companies that uh, are sort of putting an increasing emphasis on marketing versus those that maybe are not. Is there a breakdown by category, by B2B or B2C? Did you notice a general trend in that sort of uptick in the importance of marketing? I don't think in that particular slide we had that broken out by the different, actually here, let me go back there real quick. So here we see, actually, this, the, the, the only thing I can say definitively, because I don't have all the other breakouts available, is that B2B was a bigger winner than B2C. So they're all positive, um, but they're but they're not, um, but, but B2B companies definitely picked up more importance than, um, than B2C companies. And there's other and just, results, again, if you, go ahead, go ahead, Earl. Well, just a reminder to the, to the audience that uh, if they can uh, go to the uh, site for the entire report, these breakdowns are there in great detail. And, and obviously for you to, to try to address these, uh, it's, it's a little tricky off the top of your head, but generally speaking, B2B made out better in this situation, it sounds like. That's right. And, I, uh, and, and again, you can look by the size of the revenues of your company, the number of employees, uh, the percent of sales that you have over the Internet. We cut every single result by five indicators. So that's the, re the report that we call results by firm and industry characteristics. And it's, you know, like a 250-page document because it takes every one of these results and cuts it five ways. <laughs> Right. So probably the best exactly. thing to do is go to the website, you know, look at the report, and then search for basically importance, you know, the word importance or marketing and function importance, and it'll take you right to those breakouts. That's great. And speaking of importance, as you and I discussed before, I think this next and final se section is really very insightful and interesting for the audience about the missed opportunities. So why don't we go to that, and then we'll have a little time for Q&A at the end. 
Wonderful. Thanks, Earl. Okay. So I did want to circle back and um, point to, I think um, there were, there, and there may be more than this, but these were the ones that really stood out to us in our analysis of, of maybe where marketers could have um, taken a slightly different approach. And I think there's still time for this, which is one of the reasons I wanted to go over these. So the first missed opportunity is that uh, marketers did seem to turn inward to problem solve during COVID-19. So what we did was we asked people, what type of information has your company used to guide your marketing strategies during the pandemic? And check all that applies. So they could check as many or as few as were applicable. And what really dominates, if you look to the left in that first column, was the focus on what we call internal advice or internal information. It was marketing team members, it was top management team, it was conversations with your own sales teams. Um, that really did dominate uh, what marketers were doing in, in, instead of thinking about, at least from my opinion, the real opportunity was probably in that middle bin around external sources. This is where marketers are superior. You know, we have this kind of outside in view. We're folk, you know, we, we, we understand our customers and partners and even our competitors. And so I think there was an opportunity for marketers to tap into these different sources of information that you see listed here. Uh, I was really surprised that more didn't do quick research with customers uh, or look at their own website analytics or just look at what other companies were doing, whether they were competitors or, or, or non-competitors. Um, and then of course on the right-hand side was just other similar experiences that may have shed some light on how they might have reacted differently. So I think that's, that's interesting. And just to kind of give you a, a, a perspective on this to, to see w which companies did look in these places. So retail wholesale, we have 50% overall for the sample, but almost 71% of resale wholesale companies cited learning from competitors. Tech companies, um, which might not surprise some of you because of the focus on kind of usability and, you know, really tapping into customers, uh, were heavy users of, of quick research with customers. And then with partners, we see down here on the bottom, transportation companies, 100% of transportation companies turn to their partners. Um, and I'm going to skip the HEB example, but if you just want to Google this San, San Antonio-based supermarket HEB, they are the company that I wanted to just point to. Um, they did a lot of preparation. They started in January when they saw some of this happening. They reached out to their Chinese counterparts and their Italian counterparts and tried to learn as much as they could. Um, and they've also had a long-standing emergency plan in place. Um, so it's, it's worth studying this company as a case study um, to, 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 to get some insights. The second, I think, missed opportunity is around customer acquisition. So marketers reported, as you can see from this first indicator, that 65% of them believe that new customers have been attracted to our products and services during the pandemic. However, um, only 14% rank customer acquisition as their number one or 22% as their number two um, objective. So it's a bit of a disconnect there. And only 30% or so use marketing employees to make contact with leads. So there may have been a bigger opportunity here. Uh, marketers seemed to understand that, but then when we asked them about their strategies, they didn't seem to be following through on that. And there were, again, some sectors that, that did do this. Technology, again, stands out, as well as professional services slash consulting stood out as focused on customer acquisition. The third missed opportunity is that marketers tended to kind of stay in the funnel if you will. So we asked them, how much of your marketing efforts focused on building and managing the funnel or non-funnel related activities? And as you can see, about 59% of the focus, sort of the attention was spent on the funnel. Um, but I think this overlooks two potential important uh, opportunities. And I mentioned I was going to come back to this. I think there's two in the middle here that, were, that are really important growth opportunities 
for companies that were that are not inside the funnel uh, that were in fact weekly prioritized. That is expanding into new products and services and building partnerships. Let me just talk about those in a little bit more detail. And we can see that some companies um, were were actually quite good at this. Uh, some sectors rather, so CPG and manufacturing much better on the new products and service route and technology and professional services again on the partnership front. And we see this when we ask the, uh, when we ask the question about what are your employees doing, again, 60% are focused on things that are going on in the funnel, um, but less than 45 are focused on, 45% use their employees to generate new products and services, less than 31 prioritized exploring new partnerships, um, and in a different indicator, again, lining up with the same kind of findings, less than 16% used social media to identify new products and services. There are companies that stand out. Technology is sort of a common denominator here that we see across these different activities that um, there seems to be um, some differences there in terms of their behavior. And, you know, one way to think about it, and Earl, you and I have talked about this, is the fact that, you know, uh, necessity is often the mother of invention, right? And so in this tough time when, when um, it, during the, the pandemic, it may have been a good opportunity to think about new products and services. And then uh, finally here, uh, this is the last one that I'll, I'll focus on, is just that marketers seem to move a little too fast for experimentation. Um, technology, again, stands out, but when we've, we've been charting the level of experimentation that marketers have been using, and we see that number drop down to 31% during the pandemic. So people were improvising, but they weren't really experimenting. Um, they weren't investing in their experimentation capabilities as shown here. So I think we'll stop there and see if we can take maybe a couple more questions before we finish and then we'll close. Great, thanks very much. Well, uh, please do send your questions in. There's time for a couple more still. I would uh, just ask a, a question that came up early and we said we would maybe discuss now. And that is um, how, uh, it was, it was surprising to you and to us, I think, that uh, people were not as sensitive to price uh, and uh, maybe still looking for quality even in a recession. But we know for many, many reasons this is different. And I wonder to what extent, because this is a healthcare care uh, pandemic, uh, raising issues about personal safety and certainly trust and then certainly with Black Lives Matter and, and other uh, controversies in the last few weeks, people uh, have got a lot on their minds, and I wonder if there is sort of a flight to comfort, not just in physically uh, cocooning in homes and things, but sticking with familiar companies, brands, uh, maybe not looking as sh uh, to be a, quite as sharp a dealer, you might say. Just wonder your thoughts about that. You, you mentioned the role of trust looming so much larger. It seems to me that's part of what's underlying some of these changes or a lack of changes that we're seeing. So just mm -hmm. your thoughts about I think that, that. Well, that's well put. Uh, well, I think, you know, flight to meaning as well. I think, you know, in a time when life gets stripped down really to its core, right, for most of us, you know, um, that knowing that these companies that we engage with, that the expenditures that we're making really do reflect who we are, um, either as companies, if we're a business customer or as a household consumer, I think it's something that probably we we know that customers are increasingly thinking this way, but I think the pandemic puts that into stronger relief. Uh, so I would say as much of a flight to safety as a, as a flight to meaning and purpose. And um, it's something that I do think companies need to, to think seriously about. And I don't think that necessarily means they have to become politically active. Uh, it does mean that they should think about their larger role in customers' lives. Um, and in the world in which we live, um, and I think it's 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 worth thinking more deeply about. And I know others have considered this question um, in more detail as well. I think that's a, a great general insight, maybe to end on. Unfortunately, there there were a couple of other questions. Uh, I'm sure that Chris would love to hear from folks if you'd like to follow up. 
Um, I want to personally thank uh, the CMO Survey and Chris, the American Marketing Association, uh, Red Point Mobile, Brittany Keegan, uh, for uh, allowing us to participate in this. Just want to say it's been enjoyable, and I hope folks have found this uh, helpful.